One of the shortest, one of the shortest books in the Bible. You'll get to Zechariah. If you'll go to Malachi, which is the last book, go back to Zechariah, then go to the one right before Zechariah, Haggai. And we're going to be there the whole time. Haggai. I want to do something before we get started. I want us to bow our heads. And I know some of y'all might be warm in here tonight. I'm Sorry about that, uh, but I'm hoping that mo most of you will be okay. We're trying to get adjusted between winter and springtime, and so um, I'm, I'm sorry about the temperature. Let's bow our heads a moment here. I want to pray. We have had quite a few folks come out on visitation. We're going to have a, a Thursday evening again, 6 o'clock, Thursday evening at 6, and then, of course, if you want to come early, you can. And we're also going to have Saturday morning. So I encourage you, either, either time, if you can, to come. And even on your own, if you can, to go. But I want us to pray and ask God to bless these times as we go out. And also bless the Walker family. Lord, we come to you tonight. And we ask you to please uh, bless these times that we've set aside to go out and see people and see families and see children and God you ordain our steps and you show us where to go and you direct us God and bless the Thursday evening time and the Saturday morning time and other times as we go out 
God, please show your power. And God, please bless us and direct us and, and show us exactly where to go and who we need to speak to. And uh, God, please use us. Uh, use us as we go and, and give us divine appointments as we go and bless our visits. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Brother Rudy, can you do me a favor? Can you go find Brother Han? He's probably over in the office and tell him as soon as he can. We need him to come over. We may need to adjust this air just a little bit, bring it maybe one, two degrees down. It's, I think it's getting a little bit warm in here. Uh, there he is, there he is. We may need to turn that air on just a little bit, Brother Jeff, just maybe one or two degrees. I don't know what it's saying right now. It's probably 74, 75 in here. We're getting warm. All right, we'll take care. We're not going to freeze you, I promise you. All right, uh, look at your Bibles, book of Haggai. And uh, I want to preach from this book about what happened here and why God gave us this book. But I want to give you a message, and here's the message I want to give you. I want you to listen. And it's something that the devil uses to discourage us and to hurt us. And here's the thought. We work for God, and God works for us. Now let me say both of that. We work for God, and God works for us. A lot of times the devil will get us discouraged and down and depressed when we get these things out of balance and we get them out of order. And here's what I mean by that. We either get too heavy on this side or we get too heavy on this side. Here's what happens. There are some people that will have this attitude. Well, you know, God's work is great and God's work is awesome, but you know God is all-powerful God's a great, big, mighty God, and if God wants anything done, he's going to do it. They did that, by the way, with William Carey. William Carey had a heart to, for the world. He wanted to go uh, to India and preach the gospel. And in his day, they said, oh, you sit down. If God wants to save the heathen, he'll save them without you. And we know that's not true. God uses human instruments. And then there are those that do this. They'll get too heavy on the other side. Well, we've got to work for God. We've got to do this, and we've got to do that. We've got to be on fire for God, and we've got to build the Sunday school classes. We've got to build the bus routes, and we don't take time and ask God to do His work. For God to work in souls, God to save lives, God to bring Holy Spirit conviction. And both of those errors are terrible. They're wrong. But what we need is we need the balance. We need an understanding that God is great and God is mighty and God does work. But he needs us to do the witnessing and he needs us to do the praise. Amen? We've got to be concerned about both. Now, I want to show you some things from this story, but I want to give you a little background to understand what this book is all about. If you'll look at it, it's a little too chapter book, Haggai. And here's what it's about. If you'll recall, in the Old Testament, there was Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, and then there was Judah. Judah was the good, the better, God, more godly uh, portion of Israel. The northern kingdom had gone off into idolatry a lot sooner than the southern kingdom, Judah. But Judah was getting into idolatry, and God loved his people, and he said, I'm going to bring judgment. And God did that. By the way, in the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah said there are going to be 70 years that God's people are going to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. That's part of, like, when you read the book of Daniel. Daniel was some of those first ones that was brought out. Daniel and his three friends... And that happened in about 605 uh, B.C. The 70 years were spent in Babylon. Then God allowed them to start coming back to the homeland, to Jerusalem. Y'all remember the story of Nehemiah? Nehemiah comes back and they rebuild the walls. Well, Nehemiah is after Haggai. Haggai's before Nehemiah. 
Zerubbabel was the governor who came back. And they came back to rubble. I mean, they came back to a destroyed city, burned gates, broken down walls, and guess what? Solomon's temple destroyed. The great, beautiful, immaculate Solomon's temple rubble. So when they started coming back, about 50,000 came back first with Zerubbabel. They built an altar to God. Amen. They did the right thing. They built an altar to God. But here's what happened. The people came back, and you can imagine, they've been 70 years away from their homeland. They started rebuilding their own houses, you know, what, where Grandpa lived and where their home was. They rebuilt their houses, and they said, well, we've got to rebuild. God wants us. And by the way, Haggai was the prophet. He was the preacher. God said, you need to rebuild the temple. And it's amazing when you think about it. God said build a temple before he asked Nehemiah to build the walls. I'll get to that in just a minute. And they did start on the temple. But something strange happened. They quit. And for 15 years, they didn't do anything. They worked on their homes. They worked on their houses. And they rebuilt their life. And for 15 years, they allowed nothing to happen to God's temple. But then God spoke again to Haggai, and God said, tell the people that they need to get right, and they need to build the temple. I want you to read with me. Let's read some of these verses here. Look at chapter 1, verse 13. Verse 13, then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you. And I'm going to tell you, these people had disobeyed God. But God gives them an encouraging message. He said, hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came, and they did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So they did rebuild this temple. And I want to give you some thoughts tonight about our work for God and God's work for us. And here's the first one. Number one, both are important. But God does have a priority. And I want to show you the priority in this story. Both our work for God and God's work for us are important, but God does have a priority, and it's this. We have got to spend time with God before God can use us to do anything for him. And here's the lesson. The lesson is where God said to build first. Now, it's not logical. It doesn't, it doesn't, logic doesn't apply. If you were going to go and rebuild a city like they did, the logical thing to do would be to build the walls first. Build the protection first. But God said, nope, don't do that. God said, build a temple first. God didn't use logic. He said, my people need a place. They need a place to worship. They need a place to reinstitute the sacrifices. Build that temple first. And so God, God's teaching us, that, watch it. Hey, what's God teaching me? I better have my time with God. Listen to me. Young people, look up here. Look at me. You better have your time with God. God will never use you to do anything until you give your time to God first. You're not going to do much for God until God does something in your heart. So put the priority, spend your time with God. And then God can use you. Don't get it out of balance. Don't get it out of order. Build the temple first. Hey, build your temple first. Build your walk with God first. Build your prayer time first. Build your relationship with God first. God, I love you. I want your power. I want your blessings. I'm planning on doing some things for you, God. 
They were, yeah, we're going to build this city. We're going to do all that. But God, I want you to help me first. Amen. Now, I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in these next few days with this revival. But we need to be making sure we're right with God. We need to be praying. We need to be asking God to do his work in hearts. We need to be asking God to give us divine appointments to find the people we need to invite. And God, you bring us to the right folks. So God doesn't have a priority. He builds the temple in our life first. All right, look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. Let me give you the second one. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. God doesn't accept our lame excuses for not doing anything for him. Read with me. Verse 2, 3, and 4. Listen to what God says. And here's what the people were saying. They were saying, well, we've got to build our house. God, you know, we've got to take care of ourselves. Read verse 2, 3, and 4 with me. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built, it's not time. It had been about 20 years. Five years as they got settled and 15 years of no activity. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye who dwell in your sealed houses, and this house of God, the house of God, lie waste? God's man, God's preacher was saying, hey, God's not taking your excuse for not doing anything for him. Get it done. Build his house. Build his work. You know, a lot of us, I'm telling you, we do just like, you know what they did? They excused themselves. Well, you know the weather's too hot or we would start on the Lord's house. Well, the weather's too cold now we start on the Lord's house. Well, you know it's too wet so we can't start on the Lord's house. Well, it's too pretty so we got to go work in our fields. You know, you can come up with any excuse. God doesn't accept them. God says, wait a minute, look what you're living in and look what my ark has. Nothing. There's nothing there. God doesn't accept our excuses. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said this. Seek ye first. Hey? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the and you know what he, you know what Jesus was talking about there in Matthew 6? Read it. He's talking about clothes, food. We got to take care of ourselves. And Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. We got way too many of us that are too much concerned about everything else and we leave God's work to, to ruin and to waste. God said, I'm not accepting excuses. No way. Look at Haggai 1 verse 5. And boy, this is plain preaching right here. Haggai 1 5. And look at Haggai 1 7. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Look, it says it twice here. Verse 5. What does it say? Three words. Consider your what? Waste. Look at that in verse 7. Let's say it the Lord of hosts. Three words. What are they? Consider your what? Do you know what God is saying here through the prophet, through the preacher? Actions speak louder than words. God said, you can say all you want to, you love God, but prove it by the way you live. Consider your ways means Look at how you're living. Look at what you're doing. You are proving that you don't love me. That's what he's saying. You know, we can say, well, oh, how I love Jesus. You know, you can sing it all you want to, but do you prove it? Amen? Do you prove it with your life? Do you prove it how you live, your tithes, your offerings, your service for God? God says, consider your ways. Consider them. You know, we all got things we know we got to do. We got pet projects. We got, but look at the plainness of Haggai. Look at verse number 6. Look at how plain God spoke to Haggai. And he said, tell them. He said, I'm not taking you all this, this. You better understand, I'm the one in charge. Look at verse 6. He said, you've sown and you bring in little. He said, you get out there and work in the fields and you sow. And guess what? I'm not going to bless it. You bring in little. You eat and you're not going to have enough. You drink, and you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, there's none warm. God said, you do all this work, and I'm not going to bless any of it. 
Because I'm the one that blesses. Look at verse number 8, 9, 10, 11. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and, br and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. I'll be glorified, saith the Lord. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And you say, well, will God actually just blow away my possessions? Look what he said in verse number 9. I did blow upon it. God said, I'll blow it away. You better put him first. Amen. Hey, you talk about the storms and watching James fan. And, hey, look, I want to put God first. Amen. I want to live for him first. Because I want God protecting me, not somebody at 3340. Amen. I want God protecting me. God said, I'll blow on it. God can bring the drought. God can, God's God. You believe that? Say amen. God's God. Look at chapter 2 and verse 4. The devil will always make sure there's some form of discouragement. You will get discouraged. The devil will make sure of it. All right, you know how the devil discouraged these people? They've been away. They've been in captivity. They come back. They, they build their houses. Haggai, the preacher, gets up. They said, God said we're not right with him. We need to build his house. And look at the first part of, of chapter 1 there in verse 14. They did. They built the house. Do you know what the discouragement was? The old folks. The old people who were still alive and they saw the first temple. They saw them building this temple and they said, that's nothing to what Solomon's temple was. And the people who had seen Solomon's temple discouraged the workers because they didn't have all the elaborate cut stones and all that Solomon had and all the wood they had from Lebanon. They were just doing what God said to do, and it was a form of discouragement. Um, and God said, hey, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me show you the verse. It's chapter 2 and verse 3 where they said it. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? That's Solomon's temple. And how you do see it now, is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? And they said they were just complaining. They were complaining, oh, it's nothing compared to what Solomon's temple was. But look what God told them when they started building. Look at Haggai 2 and verse number 4. God said, don't listen to all that. And yet now be what? Strong. He said, be strong. O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, be what? Be strong. O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be what? Be strong. The devil's going to try to discourage you, but you be strong. Amen. And you keep on and you stay with the work. And God said in verse 4, I am with you. Hey, if God's with me, I don't care who's complaining. Amen. I don't, who, I don't care. And you know what? The very, you look at me. The devil does the very same thing to us today. Well, look at what that church is doing over in Georgia. And look at what that church is doing in Ohio. And look, Hey, wait a minute. God said, I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be with you. And, I, and it doesn't matter. And I love what the Lord said in chapter 2, verse 9. Look at what the Lord said. God said, I don't care what the first temple looked like. God said, I'm going to bless this temple. The other one might have had more gold, and it might have been prettier, but I'm going to bless this one. Look at chapter 2 and verse 9. Or actually, verse 7. I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. We're going to read that in a minute, too. And look at verse 9. The glory of this latter house. You see in me, verse 9? The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. I'm going to bless this one. And you know what? Let me tell you something anyway. Can I just say this? I'm sure Solomon's temple was grand and glorious, but it still wasn't fit for the presence of Almighty God. Amen? Nothing. You listen to me. One person can get up here and sing, and it may be better than somebody else. And somebody may come in and sing and be also grand and glorious. But none of them are good enough for God. Nothing would, hey, you may have a preacher come in here 
and can preach circles around me. You may have another one come up here that's never preached hardly any of his life. It doesn't matter. Nothing we say can, can lift up our God to the greatness that he really is. Amen? Amen? We, nothing, we offer, nothing we offer God is worthy of his grandness and his goodness. Amen? Didn't matter what the first temple looked like anyway. God said, I'm going to bless this one. And my presence is going to be in this one. So don't let the devil give you that stuff. Amen. And look back at Haggai 2 and verse number 5. God said, let me tell you what's important. What's important as you work for me is my spirit and my power is with you. Chapter 2 and verse number 5. According to the word that I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Boy, underline this. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear you. Hey, all y'all look at me. You know what's important? It's God's Holy Spirit power is working. God's Holy Spirit power is working. We're okay. Are y'all getting too cold? <laughs> Amen. I hope you don't get freezing. All right, I'm feeling good up here. Amen. If God's Holy Spirit power is working, then we're going to honor and glorify God. And so here's what I want you to do. This week, walk with God. Honor God and beg God for his power. God, we need your power. We need the spirit of God to work. God, we love that Walker family. We do. They're great people, but God, you work through them. God, you work. And, and you know what? That's what the Lord said in the New Testament. He said this. He said, you, you see your calling, brethren, not many wise men. After the flesh, not many mighty but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the base things of the world that are despised. You know what? It's amazing. Look back in history at the people God used greatly. I, I named you one this morning. Sam Jones, a converted drunkard. Mel Trotter, a converted drunk, drunkard. Billy Sunday, a converted drunkard. They said D.L. Moody. Anytime Moody preached, he would just butcher the king's English. Couldn't put a sentence together grammatically. But he had a million people get saved. I'll take that any day, amen? I'll take that any day. Praise God for that. God always seems to choose to use those kind of people. Praise God. So we don't need all the fancy stuff. We just need God to work, amen? We want your presence, God. We want your blessing. That's what we want, amen? We want you. Look at chapter 2 and verse 7 and 8. It's not about, all about the outward appearances anyway. Outward appearances can fool you. Verse 7 and 8, God said, it's me. I'm the one who works. God said in verse 7, I'll shake the nations. Boy, that's what we need happening. Right? We know what we need happening to America. Haggai 2, verse 7. I will shake all nations. That's what we need happening right now. We need God to start shaking. Amen. We don't, it's not about the election. It's not about the White House. It's about God Almighty and God's house. Amen. We need God to do some shaking. God, you shake. God said the silver and the gold, they're all mine. Amen. So God shake the nation. God supply our needs. We look to you, God. It's you that we look to. If God, God's going to do the soul saving. And in God's working and us working for God, there's so many good lessons from Haggai. God, we need you. We need your power. And it's not about the fancy stuff. It's about you and your presence and us obeying you and putting you first. And you know what we got to do? I want to challenge you to do this this week. How many of you will read your Bible this week? Amen. You'll read your Bible. But when you do, here's what I want you to do. Believe it. Amen. When you read your Bible this week, look at it, read it, and believe it. Believe it. There was a preacher preaching a revival. True story. And he read this verse, and this was his text. Let me read it to you. This is his text. He said, And I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, 
It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And he preached a message on t- any two of you agree and pray it'll be done. God will do it. You know what? I believe God's word. And I, I'm not saying God will do something instantly or this week or whatever, but I do believe God. And so this preacher gets up on a Sunday morning and he preaches this sermon and he uses this text and a woman in the audience got up while he was preaching before he ended his message and said, Preacher, he stopped it. Do you believe what you're preaching? And he stopped preaching. He said, Yes, ma'am, I do. And she said, Can I say something? He said, sure. She said, my boy left for the Navy. He's going to be gone. He left already, and he doesn't know God. And I want to know he's safe. He's going to be out there in danger. I want to know he's safe. And she looked at the preacher, and she said, will you agree with me for his salvation? preacher said yes you meet me at this altar after the service and you the two of us will will meet here and pray so he finished his message and when the service was over they met at the altar and they prayed and here's what the preacher prayed he said dear God this lady wants to know her son is saved would you please save her son and would you please let her know and have the assurance that he's saved God we're agreeing well, they kept on with the revival meeting. They met that night. They had the singing. He got up and he preached again. And while the people were singing, the boy comes in and sits next to the mother. And she's shocked. And she said, while they're singing, Son, you're supposed to be on a boat. And he said, I was. We were out in the middle of the ocean and something happened. We had to come back to port. We're leaving tomorrow. Something, t- I know what that something was, amen. We had to turn around, come back, we're leaving tomorrow. And I knew I'd find you in church. So I wanted to come and sit with you in church. He heard the preacher. And Brother Paulson, he got saved that night. He trusted the Lord and got saved that night. I'm telling you what we've got to do. We've got to start reading this Bible and believing it. Amen. Got to believe it. God, help us. You're the one that works. But God, we can't be lazy. We got we to work for you. But God, we got to trust you to work. Amen. And so, number one, we need to let God do a work in us. Then he can work through us. Number two, God doesn't accept our lame excuses. We need to work for him. Number three, God says it's not about good intentions. Prove it with your actions. Number four, the devil's a liar. And he'll discourage us, so be strong. Number five, God's Holy Spirit is still remaining, still present, and he will work. And number six, don't let outward appearances fool you. God's the one who does the blessing. Amen. God blesses. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, tonight we are thankful.